from my home in San Francisco introducing the first episode in a series I'm holding for La Chapa Always Hungry. I'm going around and having conversations over food and drink with different friends and colleagues of the hospitality industry. We're talking to Brian and Mo today. Um, they own a bar called Benjamin Cooper in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. And it's a really great insight into the bar industry, um, and especially in San Francisco. Uh, it's a really great, genuine conversation. Yeah, if you know, I hope you enjoy. And stay tuned after where I will be describing these three different spirits that we drank during this conversation. Cheers. Brian Pelly, uh, born and raised in New Mexico and been in San Francisco for a little over 15 years now, uh, working with my business partner Mo for about the last eight or nine of them, and we opened up uh, Benjamin Cooper a little over five years ago, so what, 20, uh, February of 2015 we opened and uh, been plugging away ever since. Yeah. Hi, I'm Mo Hodges, um, co-owner with Brian Pelly of Benjamin Cooper here. Um, I was uh, born and raised uh, in outside the Philadelphia area in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, lived in Colorado for about eight years before I moved here. I've been here about eight years, and five of those years have been operating Benjamin Cooper. Um, and I'm excited to be here chatting. What brought you guys actually out to San Francisco? I was working in bars in New Mexico. I had left, finished, or I left college and I had started making money just bartending and waiting tables until I got on some sort of track, right? Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine recommended me coming out here with him uh, for a couple months just to see what see what it was all about. And uh, 15 years later, I never left. So we came for a few months, he took off, and I, I stayed here. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're in this, if you're in the hospitality industry, this is one of the meccas. And um, so when, when, you, when you see the level that people are operating at here, it was inspiring to me. It was definitely like this, you started to look at a hospitality as a career and not just as a way to put a little bucks in or get rid of a, uh, student loans or you know, put yourself through college. You started, it started to really have validity as, as a career, especially in markets like this in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Why did you want to open a business when you got there? Well, so for me, after working in many, many restaurants and doing years of fine dining and helping other people open restaurants and stuff, I just really wanted to try and give it a shot for myself. I've been fortunate enough to meet Mo a couple years before and kind of knew that that was the guy I wanted to work with and we saw eye to eye. So, you know, when we had the opportunity and we had another bar that closed, kind of building sold out of our control, uh, we took that opportunity to go out on our own and write a business plan, start looking at spaces, sign a lease, and ended up with this. So, yeah, um, <clears throat> kind of to read what Brian said, you know, San Francisco kind of being the, like, the beacon. Uh, city of bars and restaurants. Like, you know, working in Colorado, I had uh, opportunities to work with some great chefs, uh, work underneath some good tutelage, um, uh, some like really phenomenal bartenders that kind of pushed me. And the spirit scene was kind of, it was burgeoning and, you know, kind of growing. And eventually I felt like, you know, I, I needed to go west even more um, and seek out a little adventure. I had a friend that introduced us to put us together and we worked on a little bar called Big. Um, where we did kind of menuless cocktailing for about a year and a half. It was short-lived, it was almost like a pop-up for a year and a half. Yeah. Um, but we were able to really kind of view upon it uh, what we wanted to. And when that kind of closed down, you know, since seeing as we weren't owners, we were just kind of running the place. We kind of were like, well, you know, we, I really like, we liked having the control. Mm -hmm. And we liked being able to kind of control the paradigm a little bit and yeah. the discussions and the menu and stuff like that. Um, we knew we needed to scale it somehow too. You couldn't just do a completely you know, completely menuless cocktail. You can do those in small, like, you know, go to the hideout at Dalva. It's like eight seats back there. You can, you can do it then. But we wanted to do something a little bit bigger, but not too much bigger. Um, and we, we kind of came upon uh, the guys that own this building and they, they kind of put an offer in front of us that we, you know, where they, they would kind of invest in us. And we came and looked at the space and it was just a blank template. It was just a gray, concrete room without a floor basically yeah. um, and but it's funny when you see that it's kind of like it's it's easier to envision a place in a place like that because you can kind of you can kind of just kind of squint your eyes and start seeing all the layouts and stuff and we kind of like the blank canvas the yeah, and, and I think for us that was our first time either of us got to work 
with a blank canvas completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, I've, 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 re I've touched up places and consulted yeah, yeah. up places, but you're always going into something that is already existing, kind of and you're trying to kind of clean it up or make it uh, more, um, yeah, was, you know, yeah. yeah, you're trying to streamline it, right? You're trying to yeah. make it more beneficial to the restaurant, more profitable for the restaurant, smoother for the customer, faster, less wait times, all that. But when you get a real chance to look at a space and build it out to, to, to what you know you want to do there, I mean, we have a thousand square foot bar and we probably have 400 square feet of it behind our bar because yeah, yeah. it's a dance floor back there, you know, and that was purposeful. We know we, for the type so this of- This was a dance floor? Oh, I mean, behind that bar is huge. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's back there, it's nice. Yeah, it does yeah, a lot of- Yeah, we room wanted to have enough space because, you know, we're not, we're not, yeah. so, so we're, some of us are very small people and so. stuff. <laughs> some of that is also, uh, you know, building uh, building code with what you have to have behind the bar now as far as room and uh, wheelchair accessibility and everything, so. Uh, some of it was a little out of our control as far as how big the area is going to be, but we always, you know, it's for us the idea is what's the point of jamming 300 people in a room if you can only take care of 50 of them the right yeah. way? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's always customer based first. It's always about that customer's yeah. experience. Um, yeah, that's one thing that like from the from the get go we kind of had that that idea. You know, even the shape of the bar having kind of more of a square or it's, or like a, a horseshoe bar, if you will. Um, I like people's eyes at each other. I, I like our, I like being surrounded by people and, you know, and being able to, you know, behind the bar having three wells, you know, in, in a space that you probably only need two, but having that third one just to be able to like, you know, get a cocktail into someone's hand and like, let them like relax and enjoy themselves and not be like, oh, this, you know, craft bartender is taking forever. Yeah. You know, we like to, we, we, we like to kind of build a culture of, you know, enjoying the company of the guests as opposed to just, you know, you know, tuning our own horn with, uh, yeah, us and them. We, we definitely like that idea of more of like a communal kind of sense in the bar. And that kind of somewhat of a, you know, a 270 degree view where people can kind of, it's really fun actually for the customers. And some of the things were unintended, you know, never working in the bar in this shape. Um, you don't realize how interesting it is for people to get a different vantage to watch your work. Uh, when you're sitting in front of a bar, you know, much of it's happening below the bar. Mm -hmm. It's happening at waist level. You don't really get to see it without peering over awkwardly. But when you're at this, this bar, there's spots where people will sit by themselves and spend 30 minutes just watching the bartenders make drink and they're blown away, you know, and, and how much stuff comes out, how quick it is, and how they're able to talk mm -hmm. to people and do this. So it's really cool. It kind of brings people into the behind the bar world almost. It's almost like yeah. a shark cage for, for, for drinkers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's well, what it's like, yeah. the glass window. And bringing them into that, like we're not trying, you know, I mean, yeah, you, you have to be conscious that it's, it's kind of like Benihana. <laughs> <laughs> there you yeah, go. But, but, why, why is Benihana fun? It's not like the food's that great, but hey, sorry, Benihana. But, like, <laughs> it's, it's, but, it's, I'm sure but the service is fun, you know, yeah. like it's the excitement of being on top of, on top, like being in the action and stuff. It's like, it's like sitting behind the penalty box at a, at a hockey game. Like you like being in the mix. Yeah. You know, it's it's really fun. Um, and it just it breeds inclusion, right? Yeah, it brings just, inclusion. That's the thing. Like you know, people really like to know their baristas. Like they have a strong attachment, and well, there's no difference. I mean, there is a difference. Uh, but having a really excellent barista is hard to find. It's but that loyalty. Yeah, you want to feel that connection with someone, which is why I think like pop ups became so popular. Is that people want to go because it's their chance sure. to chat. Um, kind of like what, um, I don't know if you've ever done, um, um, we're just kind of talking here, like uh, Co over in, uh, like Naked Kitchen over in the Mission is uh -huh. one of those spots where we've done some events with friends there, and like, it's just so fun, because you're eating in the kitchen, or like, they have like, a, like, you're like it's like your grandmother's dining room, it's like, yeah. and you're, you're talking with the chef, and it, it, it feels like, like a little, little, little like that, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, oh, Mr. Poyos. Mr. Mr. Poyos. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, Breaking yeah. Bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, is, right. it's got that feel where it's, yeah, I, I love places like that. I mean, for me, the thing that matters most in any, especially in a bar, in restaurants and stuff too, but I think for a bar, it really is something that's commonly mm -hmm. overlooked. People are worried so much about what they're doing behind the bar. They're not yeah. lighting, music, and, and the ambiance, you know, and that's not necessarily, that's, that is all happening before somebody gets a drink in their hand, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and those to me are the, are the three things. If those things are in line, your bar is gonna. We have people that walk into this bar when it's dark and the music's going and it's crowded, and you just see their jaw drop before they even look at a menu. They're like, Where because is they're this? just like, "Whoa, what did we walk into? What is this mm -hmm. place?" And uh, that's you know, for me, that's well, it's about the customer. And when you send that mood from the first thing they walk into the door, and it needs to be the same way when they leave. You know, you someone. My my biggest pet peeve is leaving a restaurant trying to like find someone to say thank you to, uh, and nobody's paying any attention. The yeah, hostess yeah. doesn't get like for some reason. I'm like everything was great on the way out. You just like. You get ignored, and it's yeah. like it's the last, it's kind of the lasting memory you have of that place. 
it's that last little interaction. Uh, so first interaction, last interaction, everything between, they're all equally as important. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, you know, kind of, I know you got some questions and stuff, yeah. but we're just gonna kind of bounce yeah. all over. Oh, I know you were gonna forward. touch on like, kind of like what, how like traveling or where you're from kind of influences that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we're both middle children. Um, so I think the idea of being heard and, you know, being communicated with and communicating with others, always being kind of like the middle ground and stuff. I think that, that actually has something to do with it. But then like our, our travels, you know, like, um, you know, traveling the world a little bit, you know, he's been to Europe quite a bit. I've been all over Eastern Europe and parts of South America. Yeah. And, you know, it's when you take, it's when you have these great experiences or like, you know, it's, it's there is a little bit of anxiety when you're like traveling in another country, especially when it comes to going out to eat, not knowing where to go. That's why it's always nice when someone just like gives you a good list of like, you know, check this place out. Um, but when you go to, it's like when you're on foreign soil and you find that gem, that place that you walk into and you might not speak the language or whatever and someone just makes you feel welcome. Exactly. It's just like, you, you, you feel like you're, you could, you know, you'd be anywhere in the world. And you somehow have a conversation with them without yeah, like and that's what like food and drink, and it's because the food and drink is just like it's like the catalyst, right? It's it's what it's is, the common ground. It's kind the of common ground. That it's just but it's it, it's the, the commonality everybody's got. It's the, like the the little bit of um, it's those little touches, the lighting, music, um, and I think a warm, smiling, friendly face yeah. like really goes a far way. Being greeted when you walk into a place that's something yeah. that just goes. When is people it, greet you and say goodbye and say hello, there's just like this energy in a, in a place that, that makes them a point to do that. And you that, can have a little banter. Yeah. And, and I, I, I mean, you know, I understand that not everyone wants to sit and have a conversation. I probably talk too much. So, <laughs> but uh, but I just think that it's, you know, from a hospitality perspective, you're, if you're doing it for anything other than your customers, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Yeah. Um, and if you're not in this to make people happy, you don't get joy out of that, then really you're doing, you're not in it yeah. for the right reason. So. Right. And, you, you know, and that should be that should be the first thing people feel when they come in is that warmth. Um, yeah, and like when you get your drinks taste better. When too. you establish that kind of like like um, mutual trust in each other, you know, like they've trusted you to be cool, and you know, you obviously feel warm and welcome from them. Then you can really start talking about, you know, especially like when places like Mexico and stuff, you can start finding out like how they're marinating their pork. Yeah. You know, like yes. you know, like oh, you're using that. sour oranges, like agrodulce, kind of things like that. Um, that's when you start, once, once you can kind of like, kind of cut through the jib jabba and you can get down to like, what what's really going on there, what they're doing, find out like about, you know, and they're gonna tell you five other places that you should go that yeah. maybe you, you didn't know about. Um, but I really do like that, like the, the, the building of, like the, the kind of understanding of cultures and building of trust and stuff or why someone's sitting in your place allows them to ask them to you, why do you do this this way? Why do you? Why are you using that, you know, blue American corn whiskey in this drink? Or what is the, you know, what why? Is are, whiskey and what's yeah, yeah, yeah. Bourbon. And they, because they feel comfortable asking that question, and you feel, com you know, you feel like, you know, you, you can finally really share your passion because you don't want to just be like, well, we do this because of this, this, this. Yeah. You know, you don't want to give them all, all the stuff at and once. You gotta get rid of any kind of you know, level of elitism, elitism, which happens a lot in bars, right? Where it's like, I'm gonna tell you what you should drink. I'm gonna, it's yeah. like, no, look, like I, I wanna find you the drink that's gonna make you the happiest. Yeah. And it's yeah. really the same, you're saying the same thing, you're approaching it two different ways. Yeah. And once but one of them is inclusive and it's it's yeah. equal and it's, let's just do, it. the other one has got this superiority kind of complex to it, which is something that, you know, I think that it's, it's dissipated a lot in the bar yeah. industry, but it's something that years ago when we were starting, I mean, I can't tell you how many bartenders wouldn't come into our bar because we didn't have a menu and they didn't know who we were and they just thought like, no, oh, this this has got to be a joke. These guys, you know, this is this isn't going to work or something. This, that idea, I think that's what traveling is so good for. Is mm -hmm. traveling it forces you to get out of your box, to open your mind, to open your eyes. Yeah, um, you uh, a little bit more to, to put ability. yourself in someone else's hands. And also that a new recipes, and, and, right? Yeah, like, new how recipes. How much are you guys influenced by? Well, the there's name. always going to be that that. To, as far as inspiration, I mean, traveling, I think the, the most obvious thing is it inspires you, right? You yeah. come home with, you come home with something you didn't well, have. It's you like, like write it down? Well, it's you like you're, like you just kind of take the blinders off, really. Like your, your aperture goes. You're way more open to it. Yeah. I, you know, so I'm not really, I've never, I'm not huge on right. writing stuff down personally myself. I think that for people that are, that's the way that they're my work, you should do it. Yeah. I find myself, I tend to put an idea in my head and I'll, Think about it for like day after day yeah. after day. And We're good I'll, obsessive. I'll spin it around in my head 15 different ways, and I think I should. I still have a little bit. 
uh, that I think I should, should do this, it. I'll do a little bit more. Yeah, this is the um, pachuga. pachuga, so made with chicken. My yeah. thing about writing stuff down is I find sometimes when I when I write something down, I lock into what I wrote down and I don't explore it as much as if I if I just leave it in my head and I'm like, well, this could go this way, this, and then you start talking and someone else says something, and next thing you know, you, you're thinking about it another way. So uh, I, I like the, the yeah, well, the process of it when it's just kind of I like to float things well, so in my head was, for days before I actually. So an example of that. Embark on it. So like a few a bunch of years back, I did a big long like six thousand kilometer road trip through Eastern Europe, like mm -hmm. Slovenia, Croatia. Um, um, uh, we were we were in uh, Romania. We were in um, uh, Hungary and Czech Republic and uh, Serbia, and it was like we kept finding these. It's kind of same, same, but different. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all these palinkas or, you know, rakias, they call them in some parts. Uh, but basically it's slivets, you know, it's your clone, it's yeah. your unaged O2V. Um, and you name the fruit, they're making it out of it. So it was cool to kind of try very different things and like also be informed by the place you just went to. And so you'd learn a couple things about, you know, or you'd say it and they'd be like, oh no, that's how they do it in Romania. We yeah. don't do it like that here. But I'm like, y'all do this, y'all do this stuff the same. Like, let's be honest here. You're all, you're all making this stuff in your backyard and it's amazing. Yeah. Um, but it's but those flavors, you know, paired with going to the market, because like, you know, they, they ask you like, um, you know, David Sedaris, one of my favorite writers, he always talks about when he goes to a new country, he just wants to find out about their Christmas traditions. <laughs> like, because it, it's, it's like a baseline. But my thing, so my, my thing like that would be markets. Yeah. Like I love going to like produce markets yeah. and like, just seeing what people are cooking with on like their own. See, and like just, and not the even like, the, the smells and stuff like that, because that's the stuff like you know that really sticks in your head, right? Yeah. Like you'll 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 never forget the way that peach smelled in you know in Serbia. And, yeah, or like tomatoes in Italy. You know, yeah, like tomatoes that's... in Italy, basil and stuff like that. <laughs> but when you can see that, and then kind of just watch where people are buying too, like you know buying patterns and stuff like that. For me, if I, I don't know, it's just something I like. Like you know my my I think my my. My simple goal when I go to a foreign country is by the time I leave that place, I want to be somewhat assimilated. Mm -hmm. Like I want to make it. I want to be able to go to a restaurant and like order like a local, or I want to be able to go buy you know produce like a local, or like you know order a drink the proper way, the way they do it, understanding the traditions yeah. and or kind of like just the the the, the nomenclature or yeah. or even just you know the way people just act around each other. You know the the passerby. So kind of stuff. like a, do you like to? You, you know, I also ask for lists um, on where to go, and I can be a little picky about who I ask for my list from. Sure, yeah, yeah. Well, that's um, half the, getting a list is, is it's very 90% about who gave it to you. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's this great, yeah. great place in Times Square. Yeah, I have a few, like, Guy, Guy yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like when I hear the, the uh, I, it's so many hotels, and especially when you're in a town you know, and you listen to the guys at the front desk, and they're making the recommendations for restaurants, and you can tell that they're not going out eating at any yeah. of the places around, so, you know, it's, it's the 24 hour night, it's around here, it's like I've heard people suggest Pine Crest, Pine Crest all these places and I'm like, I want to I want to shake them and take them aside and be like, do you, yeah, know like what's four the, in the morning, yeah. like, do you know what's the other way? Do you know how many good restaurants there are two blocks the other way? Yeah, I mean, the, the, right yeah. like, the amount of food you can get. I mean, so then when you guys travel, so yes, yeah, so you ask for stuff, you like to have some stuff pre-lined, like mm -hmm. we like to have at least one nice restaurant booked, like we'll try yeah, to get yeah. to a mission star or something like yeah. that if we can afford it in the budget. Yeah, but like, then I, I like to I like to for, meander and yeah, pop yeah. in and explore and yeah. talk to locals. That yeah, so I yeah, do that. Like, so Emily and I, like we went to uh, we were in Italy last year and we talked to our friend Virginia Miller. She's like a writer, you know, world yeah. world writer or whatever. And so we had oh, our. We had like two, we were there for like maybe like five, six days. But we had like two good meals booked that were like good recommendations that we were super pumped. And then from those recommendations, like, you know, which were both, they both turned out really well. We got recommendations from the people that work there, you know? And I think there's also a thing being in the service industry, I can like expunge the information oh, yeah. a little easier. I can, right. And they pick up on it pretty quick. They're like, so you work, what restaurant do you work for? <laughs> like. But you it's know. worth dropping that our industry. Yeah, I think the key to what, when, when I travel is I, I try to not just get lists from one person. I like to ask. Yeah, them, yeah. Like when I was in Mexico, you start seeing the cross yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 You start to like, see. You start to see the common eyes of like this is a must hit. Which when both of them tell you like make sure you go there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know. Like for me, I've been going to Mexico City the last few years. Every year I go to Mexico City and spend a few days there, kind of on the way to somewhere else and. Uh, 
you know, uh, we have a very good chef, Val Cantu from California, who's Jade's beer dominated. He's like, you know, he, says, he says the place is good, he probably Yeah, like, he gave me this list. He, he, he also did some uh, staging where he was in Mexico City for, I think, yeah, three worked, or four he months. Worked, he worked for Pujol. Yeah, yeah he worked for like Pujol. He, did, he worked for great restaurants. But so he gave me this list that was just like, and that I can trust. I'm like, here's a Michelin star chef. That's telling me here's the street taco place. Here's the and he and knows the corner. They give you the corner street. I don't want to. Uh, I, I don't want to go to a place and only experience the Mission Star. I like for me to be honest, that's not the way that I generally no. enjoy dining. And it's while I think the food can be awesome, but that, my ADD, my my uh, lack yeah. of, of able to concentrate for that long really lends itself to be able to move around and like have street, snacks here. You want street taco. I love street like, you food. You go to Puerto Vallarta, like, yeah. you don't want to on a pizza. Yeah. Yeah. That's you my, want, that's, the amount of sandwiches you want. So this oh, is the way I love to eat when I go. So I will do some couple nice dinners and, you know, the girlfriend's family or, uh, you know, you'll, uh, but for me, that's not what I look forward to the most. I, I must admit, like, when I go, my favorite thing in Mexico City is, by far, it's the street food, you know? Yeah. It's not yeah. the... Or go, even the go down to the go, yeah, go down to the Zocal, walk around down there, and you just like pop in. Something smells good, pop in, try a bite. If that yeah. thing's really good, you get a couple more. Yeah. But this is the way. One of the yeah. Bars. Then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's it. It's it's, a, it's always like a drink and a plate, and I just yeah. you just kind of do that all day. Like that's my that's my favorite way to travel. Um, yeah, I remember being down in Peru near this place called Colca Canyon. It's like where you go see like the big condors and stuff. And the little town we were like staying in, we just stayed in like a little. Um, little hotel or something there. Um, they had, it just happened to be, it was around, I think it's the Immaculate Conception. Um, uh -huh. it was like, it's like right before Christmas, you uh -huh. know, it's when the Immaculate Conception happened. I kept calling it the Immaculate Reception when I was down there. <laughs> uh, or then it, even further you could say it's the Immaculate Conception Reception, you know, because anyway, so they have these like street uh, festivals. And I remember like, because, you know, you get to parts of like South America where you're, you're doing, it's, it's a lot of starch and it's a lot of like, it's pretty, but anyway, so we were like walking in this, like this fair and it's, it's so crazy because it's talking about an in, intersection of cultures. You have an immaculate conception party, but everyone's wearing their Incan like traditional garb doing traditional Incan dances, but it's for a, a, a Western, a Western religion. Um, but anyway, so we're walking through and like, you know, there's little like vendors and stuff and a lot of like things on sticks, meats on sticks and stuff. And it, my buddy Daniel that I was with at the time, we were just looking around and all of a sudden this smell of like fried chicken hits our, and we look over and you just see like, it's like a little bit of line is formed and it's, and there was other fried chicken places, but there was definitely a line at this one. And we're like, that one's gotta be the one. And you like, you sit up and you just kind of like scoot down. You, it's like a little, little bench almost in front of it. And you, the lady just puts it up and you're kind of eating as you're scooting down. By the time you get down, you've done, you're done your fried chicken, <laughs> and four more people kind of get on there. And you got all the, they had all these um, like ahi sauces, which is like their, their kind of like, uh, their like pepper sauce down there. And it's like this yellowy, but it's like buttery. It's kind of like a good habanero sauce. Like that's like almost like, it's like creamy almost. Yeah. Um, and you have that and you're just kind of doing that. And she had a little bit of like local honey. And it was just like, like I'll never forget that, you know, that, that fried chicken smoke. Cause it was like, we just, it kind of just, it found us, you know, and that's, that's, that's what's the nice. best kind of food experience. Yeah, when, when food finds you, it's, yeah. it's, it's really exciting. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, sorry, real quick, just to kind of, just to touch on kind of where we started with all that too, with the, like, with traveling. I think that one, one thing that's, one of the reasons Bob and I love working with, with each other so much, and we've always kind of had a, a, a similar look at, look in on cocktails from the outside, right? And it's, you know, our favorite, our favorite books to, do cocktails from is the flavor bible it's not a cocktail book it's the idea of taking food really and we both have this restaurant background really taking the same things that apply in food and applying them to cocktails mm -hmm. and that's not to say you're going to do sweet bread cocktails stuff like that but yeah. there's just there's an idea that uh i'm sure some assholes try it yeah. <laughs> he's probably pointing at us but uh, yeah i just i i for us, I think that idea, it opens up the doors. If you start looking at cocktails and the things that, well, it's strawberry and it's peach and it's yeah. fruit. It's like having it's, a good pastry. It's a liquor, a bitter, a sugar, a fruit. And a pastry chef. So, you know, to be able to look at things. Can you, like, you know, food, like savory food, like, okay, I made the tamales and like, wasn't turning out right and I just kept messing with it and knowing what to throw in and playing oh, with it and I don't follow yeah. a recipe either. I just write down yeah. the name. Yeah. I think there's it. times, so, there's, there's your base. Else? I think I think yeah. That, yeah you have your base. We have we have what we call cocktail band aids, right? Which is just like sometimes you're making something and it's like, oh, it just it's not. And there's just certain things you can do when you're doing. Well, you, so you know, you know how 
You know, know a couple things that are like instant fixes, and sometimes they they feel yeah, like, like an easy way out. They feel like, like a shortcut. Like brand aged brandies are like like our cognacs and stuff. If you have like a drink that you just need a little bit more of a smoother edge, or you need like another touch of like vanilla, or like a little more. A lot fruit, of the way we use vermouth. So a little say vermouth like that. In the same way. Like uh, then the obvious ones, like the passion fruit ginger beer. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, elderflower. These things that you just that are kind of almost they're they're Maraschino almost, liqueur. Yeah, they're almost like token closer. token, token sales it. terms in this industry yeah. now. Like they just people. You know what I realized too? Like in a lot of but they uh, really are a quick way to, to just I've take something that that's here in a lot of uh, right like the iced teas that you find, like some just like guayaki, like the mates uh -huh. and all like the different like snapples and stuff like that. One thing I've noticed, I, I love reading ingredients. That's another thing. I love knowing what things are in things because there's a lot of things that are in there. That like, and I always kind of hated that in like competitions. They're like, "Well, you use this, but it'll really taste it." It's like, "Well, fuck off, dude!" Like, you, you need those flavors to build to get to yeah, another flavor market. sometimes. Yeah. Um, but anyway, one thing a flavor that I saw in a lot of these things is peach. Like they use like a peach tea in a lot of these other like so it'll be like a flavored tea, like a passion fruit tea, but there'll be peach in there. Just because I think it's like it's like when you do carrot juice, right? You can't like you can just juice carrot. But it's really not that interesting. Yeah. But if you throw a little celery in there, yeah. now it makes the carrot pop a little bit more. And you don't really taste the celery as much, but it definitely you're like, now this is carrot juice. Yeah. You know, it's like adding like, a little well, acid to your cooking. You're not tasting the acid, it's brightening up the flavor. Like I add a little yeah. bit to my success and it helps it stay yeah. stable, so, but all it does is just open it a little bit. Yeah. Or like a little drop of water in single malt yeah. sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a there's a lot of things like that. Um That's the only thing I I mean, it's one of, one of you know, <laughs> even when you're looking at balance of, of, of your, your acid and sugar balance in a cocktail, one of the coolest things about that when you, it's not just about is it taste tart, it's like the flavors show when the balance is right. Yeah. So if you have something that's way too tart in a cocktail, a lot of times you're flattening any other flavor you put in there. It's like yeah. not salting your food. You can't really taste any yeah. of those. Man, you, sometimes, it's, sometimes it's as simple as like a bar spoon of, of just like a simple syrup or something or a gum syrup. Mm -hmm. Into a cocktail and re like you know shake it that way, taste that, and you're like holy holy crap! Now I taste mm -hmm. everything. I mean even things like you know I remember learning like a just a simple thing for like blanching green beans, like salting the water and cooking them in salted water, and then you're done. And then maybe a little fleur de sel or something on top, but like yeah, you, you, you have like, like and and because it gets snap. inside of it, it, it controls the snap a little bit, and those are like and so that's what I love about. You know, learning from multi generational kind of um, situations like you know, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a, had a grandmother you can cook with, um, if you're lucky enough to have someone from you know, like uh, learn from someone from another country, you know, like you know, learning from different types of people and like learning from different methodologies. Like my lakas? And, yeah, and they, my like, lakas. Um, that's where I think you really can expand because then you take it and you know what we do collectively is you take all those experiences and you take all that information you take all those techniques mm -hmm. and then you kind of you know either you remain true to them or you take them and run with them yeah. a little bit and make it your own it's yeah. like when, it, when you look up a recipe that you've never done you never just look at one recipe you look at like five recipes and yeah. you find the commonality between the two and you go you know what you I think I'm using that yeah. choose your own adventure yeah whatever yeah. whenever I'm doing something for the first time and I'm, I, I'm, I'm using bit, like videos or recipes or something to kind of yeah. gauge where Especially when you're talking about things like okay, like like say like an eggnog or a, a flip or something that kind of has a process to it, a milk punch, right? Where there's a there's a real appropriate process to the way things there are ways to together. Do it, right? uh, it doesn't mean it's the only way, but you know, so that's where I really will look. Uh, I'll look through recipes and videos and YouTube and all this. Exactly like most said, kind of put together the commonalities and then start there and then adjust. You know, uh, yes, I don't. I I think people in this business in general. Whether it's chefs or bartenders or mixologists, whatever you want to say, uh, I think that sometimes there's we look at it like like we have this beautiful recipe and it's got to be followed exact and it's not if it's not this it's not right and uh, there's it's really but even those guys within those traditionalists they all have their different opinion on how something should yeah, be and, it's like. Well, then what do you do for your bartenders here? To like, do you trust that like people have different recipes to make? Something so like I, a martini, I, a margarita, so I, 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 My thing here is, and I, I think I'm speaking for both of us here, but I, I totally understand why some cocktail, uh, some cocktail uh, uh, programs 
consistency is is huge, you know. And when you're you're putting out five hundred of the same drink and you have ten bartenders doing it, you want that drink to taste the same. And your menu is the same. Your menu is yeah, the same. Much. You know, you change it maybe quarterly. When you change five drinks a quarter, maybe the whole thing every quarter. But whatever, it's it's. I totally get that, but it's just not the way we do things. Mm -hmm. um, because we're changing our menu every week, half our menu every week. Uh, I just the fun here is that you're getting things different every time, and that you're not coming in. If you come in for the same drink three weeks later, it's not going to be on the menu anymore. Yeah. You're going to have to choose something else, and, it, and we're going to have something kind of similar. Yeah, we'll have something that fits you know, in. We, that too, we do have, we do have like, you know, it's one thing that we we've kind of. I guess we have developed things over five years. Yeah, we have a template um, of what we want on the yeah, menu. Yeah, we have the structure of your menu. Yeah, yeah it kind of goes like yeah. touch boxes, but the same way a chef does. You have appetizer, soup, salad, but it, you know your soup is going to depend on what's fresh that yeah. day, that week, those three, whatever they can get it. So for us, it's the same thing. We just we like changing the cocktail all the time. And sometimes I'd rather give someone a menu of twelve cocktails and let them uh, not be so overwhelmed with a, a written first choice and, and feel like you know this whatever pick one use one page. I don't want to walk into a, to a bar and be given a newspaper when I'm trying to hang out with a friend and I've got to go through twenty different categories of drink. And to, to me, it's overwhelming and it takes my attention from where I want my my attention to be. So uh, so for us, I think that's that's a big part of it. But in that vein. I like my bartenders to make sure they're giving somebody a, a, like a personalized experience. And part of that is that if you're talking to this bartender and you're talking to him about his old fashioned, he's going to give you that old fashioned the way he likes it, the way he thinks you like it. It's going to be exactly the same exact amount of bitters that maybe I put in mine. Or uh, and plus, I don't. I think depending on the whiskey and old fashioned should be adjusted. The amount of bitters, the yeah. it's everything to the height of where you put your zest on. Depending on the whiskey you're using, all those things you can adjust them and get different results. Yeah. So to sit and say I need everyone to do the same thing is to me is a little. You're impeding them to be able to use the things that we've hired them for. Their ability to communicate, their ability to personalize things, their palate, their their understanding of. Yeah, like and, if you don't know how to bartend, like it becomes yeah. it's pretty apparent very yeah, fast. Yeah, I mean, if you like <laughs> between a bar spoon or a half or someone that likes to use gum for a simple or. Yeah. What's well, the difference between gum and simple then? Uh, it's it's gum out of a cup, uh, which is like a stabilizer. It's also a binder. Um, so it's going to bring flavors together. Um, and it, it, it adds, uh, it's something like an old fashioned, it's going to be, you're going to get a, you're going to be able to add an outfield of viscosity without adding as much sweetness as a, as like a two to one simple would. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So really fun. But also too, it like if, you have foam on a shaking drink, if you so use, it feels like halfway to an egg. If you try to use gum syrup with egg white though, your egg white will fall flat. It doesn't emulsify. Uh, the egg white. So you'll find yourself like it's like things like like too many bit too much like like amaro or something in a sour with an egg white. Like it won't. It just doesn't give you enough foam because it's, it's not enough for it to cling on to it. Like the proteins kind of fall apart uh, a little bit. But yeah, it's like little things. But that's all stuff like you know I made the mistake of doing that one time. Like I was like that yeah. drink is not working. Yeah. And they're like oh and someone was like oh you put gum syrup in there that's why. I was like oh thanks Edith. <laughs> you know, like, yeah and, and, and I think like for me my favorite thing to do is with my partner is not to necessarily sit over their shoulders and watch them and I like watching them work but really it's when I see that like hey I, I can show you a better way to do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know not in an embarrassing way in front of the character in front of the customer excuse me. But like sometimes later that night, like hey, I saw you making an egg drink. You want a little tip on how to like make that foam fest or how? Or to, hey, check out this thing I found out about. Yeah, you know. check. So it's that that idea. I, I think it really, I think it empowers the the bartenders to feel like they're not they're not sitting here just as an extension of us. They're really they're an extension of us. They're an extension of the bar, but they really get to be themselves too. Yeah. Uh, which means also the same way they can come to us and say, hey, I, you know, the way you're doing it, I got a better way. Check this out. Mm -hmm. We're not above. <laughs> Well, not, you know, just because we're uh, just because our names on the leads and stuff doesn't mean that we we know more than them or anything at all. So yeah. uh, the idea of being open minded and uh, you know someone that has two years experience can show someone that has twenty years experience something. Yeah, there's always something to learn and, and embrace it. And I, you know that's something that I, I've seen get so much better in this industry in the last five six years that I think in the decade before. Well. It, it, and it, like, was, uh, it was falling. And short. that's the thing, like just with the way brands educate us, that we can educate the people. Uh, the way you know bartenders, you know, we have bartenders in this city that are being recognized nationally all the time. That are it's just like it's come full circle why you moved to San Francisco, where San Francisco is at, you know, and how we're going to come back out of all this this yeah. like COVID and stuff. Right now, everyone's just sharpening their tools, you know, and everyone's doing what they can. And in a way, it's like. Kind of brought us together a little bit more. Like people are, we're all feeding each other and making yeah. each other, you know, get make sure we each have a drink in our hands to like, you know, remember what things can be and 
you know, there's a lot of good support just like within the neighborhoods and across town. Everyone's sharing each other's pages and stuff, and that's that's really important, you know, and that's very satisfying knowing that, you know, I, I, I've chosen properly and right. I've been, I found myself in a really good, good city and, you know, Definitely. That's what feels pretty good. And that's the beauty, I think, of the industry is that we do all take care of each other. And I think it's, you're bringing up the point earlier, working in this industry is, it's not just a means to an end, it's actually a career. And I think that's part of the reason I want to go out and talk to people is that people don't view it that way sometimes. And it can, it can be really tough when this is your career, when it is, you are farming, you are a bartender, you are a server, like that all takes a lot of skill. It takes a lot of skill to be able to deal with people, to be able to bring up the food, to make the food, to make the drinks taste right and be on point and everything. And I think it's a, a lot of people have turned to the service industry because it's, you know, you, it's kind of the old standard, you know, you can always get a job anywhere you go. But, you know, uh, due to COVID now, like that workforce being out, I think we all need to understand like how important it is to support as much as we can, like get to a farmer's market, order from your friend's bar or restaurant, but that kind of stuff, it's, you know, we don't have to do this stuff, but for us, it's, we miss serving people so much and we miss the, just even if it's a two second interaction. Um, and we just want to remind everyone that like, we're all still here and we're all still doing it. So that's why, you know, the more you can support, the more you can write your senators and Congress people about, you know, taking care of our service industry employees and making sure that there's like money for them and you know, so we don't we don't go all all go. With it. Oh hi, it's done. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about what we were drinking. Um, so in this episode, I shared with Brian and Mo these three different distilled spirits from Mexico. Um, we have two mezcales and we have one sotol. So I'm gonna go ahead and share some facts about each of them. And um, um, sotol right here um, often was thought of as an agave or in, in, the, in that family. Um, it's actually not, it is a desert plant. It's called the spoon of the desert. It's shaped kind of like a curved Q-tip. Um, but this is actually grown in the Northern part of Mexico in Chihuahua, Durango, Coahuila. This specific one is from Coahuila, Mexico. Um, it's called uh, Sotol Coyote. So Sotol is actually the name of the plant as well as the spirit. And it takes one plant to mature for 15 years. And then one plant makes one bottle. It is just, uh, made similarly to mezcal, but it's actually got um, a nice grassy, fresh, young flavor. Um, it reminds me of like fresh cut grass. It's really delicious, really light, beautiful. Um, next, we're going to talk about mezcal. Um, often in Mexico, when you're drinking especially really nice mezcal, you, you want to sip on it. They say, dale un besito, which is give it a kiss. You just want to, just like you would a beautiful single malt scotch, a whiskey, um, something that really took a lot of time and care to make. Which, um, the distilling process is the leaves are cut, the piña, the heart of the plant is charred, and then it's mashed down and it's fermented and then distilled. It's obviously a much more complex process. I'm just sharing through the telephone how to do this. Mm -hmm. So the first one we're gonna talk about is squish. Here you are. So squish is actually made in Oaxaca um, by Felix Monterrosa. Um, and this is their tobala. I don't know if you can see that. But tobala is a wild agave. Um, this takes about 10 years to grow. Uh, we found this uh, when we went to Oaxaca over International Women's Day and in his mezcaleria that his parents owned in the 80s. They hosted an event there for uh, about six mezcaleras uh, to talk about how they make mezcal and how they got into the business. It was a very beautiful forum to be a part of. Um, the women were aged 30s to maybe 70s or older. They have been working in an industry that is heavily male dominated and have been leading crews of mostly men um, to make these beautiful, beautiful mezcales on top of taking care of their families. Um, these women were just such an inspiration. And Next, we're going to talk about La Locura. Uh, La Locura, uh, it's made by Eduardo Angeles um, and it's made in Ocotlan. Uh, uh, in Oaxaca. Um, we found him through a 
a gentleman named Omar. He took us out there. Um, he has a small tour company, small as in it was just him. He's amazing. He knows everything about Oaxaca. He's born and raised there and he has such a passion. Um, you can find him on Instagram and honestly, his tours are really for travelers that want to get off the beaten path and really explore Oaxaca for the beauty that it is and meet the people that make Oaxaca, Oaxaca. Um, and like... Eduardo uh, is actually part of the family that owns Real Minero um, and his sister runs that now. So he started La Locura um, and he does also traditional uh, methods for um, making his mezcal. Um, if you get a chance to go and visit, um, it's very, very um, low key space, but you can just see the amount of hard labor. I mean, this is like a 20 hour day making this the traditional way. Um, and it's him and a very small crew putting it together. And he's very hands on. Um, you can go into his house and in his house, he has his glass jugs. They're like five gallon glass jugs and they um, are all different parts, different distilled spirit, agave, uh, mezcal. <laughs> And then along with the heads and tails and everything is just labeled uh, the date and the plant that it was pulled from. And then he does the, the blending of the heads and tails from that distillation to make the perfect blend of mezcal. Heads come out first in the distillation, tails come at the end. So you got to carefully mix that. I don't know how to do it, but he has a beautiful scientific touch to it. Um, but anyway, so this uh, is his pechuga. Um, Pechuga is a traditional way of making mezcal um, and basically the mezcal is distilled through a chicken breast along with uh, different types of fruits, nuts, whatever the mezcalero uh, chooses. Um, think about like a mole, so it can be as few as like four ingredients or it can be over 27. Um, but it's nice and sweet. Uh, it doesn't taste like chicken. It actually just has this like meaty texture and flavor to it but it's also sweet and like beautifully well-rounded um you can't find pechuga here in the u.s it's definitely going to be expensive not this pechuga but uh pechuga style um it's worth tasting especially if you're curious about mezcal um la locura i believe doesn't sell in the u.s really a Think these two do if you have a chance to taste a nicer mezcal it's usually poured by the ounce here in the u.s um and it is expensive but the flavor will be incredibly different than something you had before it's not a mezcal that you're going to want to just mix into a cocktail you're going to want to sip it slow um, thank you for watching cheers tells you all you need you gotta be over 18 no pregnant no driving that's actually the same rules for my dating pool yeah, yeah. <laughs>